You're listening to To Hatch a Pod with Key Budge, Corey Costello, and Greg Garrett. Welcome to another episode of To Hatch a Pod. I'm Key Budge. I've got with me today Greg Garrett, Corey Costello. Gentlemen, thank you for uh, stepping into the office today because we've got a special conversation. We're going to talk to Gilbert, Arizona. Mm, can't wait. Yes, we've got uh, the Chief Digital Officer, Dana Birchman. She'll be joining us here in a moment. And the things that they're doing in Gilbert kind of resonate with me because these are the things that some of the goals that we have for our communication platform that we do here in Tehachapi. And when I started doing a little bit of research, Gilbert kept popping up. Popped up. And then I had mentioned to Kia, as I had mentioned in a previous podca- podcast, I was really excited because I've been following Gilbert, Arizona for a while. They are a smart city. And as you know, we're trying to transform Tehachapi into a smart city. What does that mean, right? It, you get smart people, you, you keep the roads clean, street lights on, but there's way more than that, right? People have a desire to live in a, in a city that really has a progressive planning, the future, thinking about what's going on, not just tomorrow, but 10 years, 20 years from now. You know, if you look at Anaheim and Costa Mesa, that was years ago, just orange groves. But now it's just a, a grid of, you know, lots of houses, strip malls, those sorts of things, Disneyland, of course. But what do we want to be in Tehachapi when we grow up, right? We don't want to be somebody else. We want to retain our identity, but we want to be smart about our planning and smart about who we are and what we're going to do in the future. I think it comes with, when it comes to digital media stuff as well. I mean, you know, in my my previous life and background as well, you don't you don't have to reinvent the wheel per se, right? I mean, and so even in my past of building up these sort of net, digital networks and things like that, you use things from other folks and and you you twist it to make it work for you and and uh, you share ideas and that's the best part too and that's kind of what we're doing today but you have you know whether it's a convention or something like that you share some of those best practices together and uh and then you kind of mold what what fits your community and i think government used to you know the bureaucracy used to work in a box but nowadays government is transforming more into uh like you know private government Mm -hmm. private business and we're sharing information and i'm really looking forward to talking to dana today well, let's invite in our guest today from Gilbert, Arizona. This is Dana Birchman. You are the Chief Digital Officer for Gilbert. Welcome to Tehachapod. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. We're, we're excited to have you. And, and I, as I mentioned probably a little bit earlier, we're constantly trying to evolve what we do and learn what other communities, what other cities, uh, government agencies are doing. And this podcast that we're doing, something that we started last March, is something that we've worked towards for a couple of years and for us to expand how we talk to the community. And then when I started looking, you guys have a podcast among a ton of other things that you do and your engagement. So we're excited to talk to you. Yeah, no, happy to be here. Yes, it's kind of a cool story. And really, to be honest, this is the whole reason conversations like these with other cities, um, the reason why we started our podcast, uh, one of the reasons that my position was originally created was because our town manager, Patrick Banger, was looking at what Michael Bloomberg was doing when he was mayor in New York City uh, in the digital space and understanding how to communicate in a way that your residents can engage with. Like you mentioned, government is, is different. And One of our big beliefs in Gilbert especially is that we need to go where our residents are. And our residents are young. The average age in Gilbert, even though we have over 260,000 residents, is 33. And about a third of our residents are school-aged children. So it's important for us. You know, these our residents are living their lives, paying their bills with Venmo. They are listening to podcasts. They are on social media daily. And so that's where we need to be. And, you know, not just when we need something uh, from them, but also always and when they need something from us. And what we found is when you do create engagement like that, especially in times like these with a pandemic, when there is vital information and reason to be communicating with your community, especially, uh, you've already established those relationships and built that trust. And so again, when you need them and they need us, we're already here. So thrilled to be here and talking with you today. One of the things I really that impressed me right from the get go was your digital roadmap. And that document outline kind of the the goals, the philosophies, the the mission statement, if you will, to to where Gilbert wants to go and how it wants to communicate with the public. I'm just looking at their website now. It says we're on a mission. <laughs> we're on a mission to be the city of the future. We choose to anticipate, create, help people. Those are really bold statements, and people want information quick so they can move on and get on with their life, right? You don't necessarily pick up a newspaper and read it from cover to cover like maybe your parents did or your grandpa did, 
podcasts are part of that communication tool, right? That portfolio. Yeah. And I, Absolutely. I know that when we talk about it, and I, I want to know what your opinion is on this, when we, we look at our, our social media platforms and how we communicate, we look at it as kind of a piece of the pie. And each of these platforms is a piece of the pie reaching the demographics of our audience. So the, the, the kind of the more pieces of pie that we have, the larger amount of people, our public, our community that we are able to reach. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Well, you mentioned the digital roadmap, and I think that I had the benefit. Gilbert grew so quickly. It was one of the fastest growing cities in the country. And I actually grew up in Gilbert, left, went to the East Coast uh, for a decade and, and moved back. And, you know, it was no longer a small town. We're now the largest town in America. And so they had never had a communications department. Uh, they never had a focus on this. And so when Patrick came in, it was really interesting because he came from a suburb of St. Louis, moved to Gilbert, thought this is a really growing, thriving city with a young demographic. Uh, why aren't we communicating this way? Our mayor wasn't on Twitter at the time, probably the only mayor in all of the Phoenix metro area who wasn't. Uh, and again, this is nine to 10 years ago. So he hired me not just as a communications director, but as a chief digital officer to kind of lay out that plan, the roadmap that you mentioned. And so it was really exciting to be able to build something like that. And you talk about the, the pieces of a pie, and I think it's really true. But um, some of that is the plan and, and, and the vision of where you want to go, but also this idea of stopping doing what you've always done, right? So instead of mailers that can cost for us up to $250,000 to mail a single postcard to every resident, when how often or how frequently are people even checking their mail uh, <laughs> nowadays? It was much more cost effective and efficient for us to think of digital ways to reach people. And, you know, th there is that feeling sometimes, I think, especially in government that, well, yeah, we're, we're going to, we're also going to do this. We're going to still keep doing the mailer, but we're also going to communicate this way. And I think it's really important that instead of kind of doubling the work, and especially right now, what we're seeing in the pandemic with innovation is kind of this, well, we, we went remote and maybe we're going to go back or maybe we're going to do both. Like we're doing virtual inspections, but we might still do it the old way, but now we're also going to do it virtually. And I'm of the belief that let's just try to do it all virtual, right? Let's just see what happens. And I'm a big proponent with our 311 system is a great example of a lot of cities will, you know, keep a call center and then also use an app. And we just eliminated a call center and kind of forced everyone to use an app. And if someone does call in, then it gets entered in manually. So you still have that data and that record and that track. It can include the data and you're not having people answering the phone. And it's been highly, highly effective. And so I think taking that risk and the risk taking and being willing, especially when you can show not only the return on the investment, the data um, that you're actually tracking, and then also the cost savings uh, tends to be a win-win across the board, whether it's you're trying to convince upper management, because I always say these efforts, so cool that you have your manager here because these efforts are really have to come from the top down. Uh, the mayor has to be invested. The manager has to get it. Uh, leadership has to understand. And then when you have that and you continue to show the value that you provide and, you know, you, you try something like, you know, closing something down and no one screams, you're like, or one person screams, you know, you're, you're usually pretty effective, right? But it's that risk. It's that in between place of, you know, going from the old way of doing things to the new way and, and really taking the chance to stop doing things the old way. That's where the innovation happens um, and where the rubber kind of meets the road and the success I think that we've seen um, has come because then you're freeing up time to do so many other things. It's, it's just like what you see happening in our parks and recreation department. You know, we're using these new um, robot lawn mowers and suddenly people that were mowing lawns are like, now I have all of this time to be thinking about these other things. And at first, you know, you hear this, whoa, is robot going to take my job? How are we going to do that? You know, so you have to navigate through those conversations. So that's what we spend a lot of time doing. And, and you mentioned it when you get to the to our website and every part of our organization, you feel this innovation, right? It's not just one pocket of the organization or one innovation officer or office. It, it's a way of thinking about how your government connects with your community and everyone has to be focused on it and committed. Or again, you're not going to see that the city of the future come to fruition. You're not going to see those smart city efforts continue and thrive. Uh, truly, I, I believe, in, unless you have the entire organization on board. You know, Dana, there's some of the 
similarities. Obviously, we mentioned that there's a big size difference between Tehachapi and Gilbert. But, you know, some of the similarities that I noticed, you you are a city in the Phoenix Metroplex and, and you share borders with other cities and communities. And, you know, Phoenix and, and Mesa and some of those groups around you, uh, Tempe and these other these other cities and towns around you. You know, we have a similar situation. And obviously, we're an incorporated city uh, in a valley surrounded by a larger unincorporated area. But they use a lot of city services, whether that's businesses, retail, shopping. And so for us, it's it's helped to have this digital media, uh, whether it's social media or the podcast, to sort of help kind of define borders and not so much just to let people know, like, you know, this is city only, but more so when it comes to their form of governance and who, you know, they complain about if, if their road out in the county is is struggling and they're not getting the service they'd like. H- have you Has that helped you all as well, considering the fact that you're sharing a lot of borders with other cities in, you know, the same situation we're sharing borders with unincorporated areas around us? Absolutely. I think, you know, one great example that comes to mind is Deloitte locating a a very large headquarters in Gilbert. And you're right, we border other cities. And when it comes to economic development, you can imagine to them, a Phoenix suburb may look just like the next. And so what would it be about Gilbert that would make a company like Deloitte choose us over our neighboring cities like Chandler and Tempe, Mesa, you mentioned. And um, the differentiators, I think a lot of them were around how we were communicating and engaging with our residents, with our school-aged children, something that we run a coding contest with our local junior high and high school students um, called Spark App League to get them thinking about uh, their future careers and the possibility of staying in Gilbert one day when they uh, do graduate and if they want to leave and go to college and come back and have a career here, something that when I grew up in Gilbert really wasn't much of an option for me. There weren't a lot of job possibilities there. And so creating uh, those opportunities and explaining uh, you know, why Gilbert is a differentiator in that space is really important. And the way we do that is through video and storytelling and showcasing a lot of the successes we have or programs and partnerships like Spark App League, which I mentioned, which is a partnership with ASU and um, with Waymo. And so these were huge differentiators, I believe, in uh, companies coming and choosing Gilbert over other places. And so again, kind of back to how this is all connected, um, it is really important because um, us, everything we do to promote Gilbert tells the story. You know, it's funny because we have a water tower that's kind of this beacon in our downtown and and people who live in Gilbert feel so much pride about it and love it. And we recently went through a rebrand and so many people were like, oh, the water tower has to be in your logo. But when you explain to people that, you know, outside of Gilbert or outside of Arizona, you're trying to sell your community again as a city of the future, as a growing, thriving place that you would want to bring your business, the water tower doesn't always sell, right? When you're, when you're marketing locally, it can be a great tool to use, um, but we've been having that discussion a lot. And so working with our economic development teams to understand that when they go to Chicago and are competing with, you know, another big city, is it, what is it, how is this look and feel and brand around Gilbert going to sell? And so it is really, really important. And to Hatchaby, our, our brand is live up. We're at 4,000 feet, a little cleaner air, a little cooler temperatures than all around us. Kern County is very diversified in the economy. And, and so we have embraced that. It's really important though. I've heard so many times where residents, you know, they are your ambassadors, every one of them. And if they don't feel the pride in your city or your community, then you really can't move forward. And another thing that you, you said earlier, it sparked my attention was showcase your successes, right? That's really important. It's not city hall's successes, right? It's the city or the community's successes. And don't be afraid to tell people what have you accomplished, right? Relish in those, right? It's a big deal. Now, whenever you fail, right, you pick up the pieces and you figure it out. You you move forward, but you need to be able to share those successes. Absolutely. And you, you know, you said it perfectly, that that community pride and tapping into that, whether it's your employees who work for your organization or the community members that are going to shout from the rooftop, you know, what it's like to live here, what it's like to work here, what it's like to grow up here. I mean, those are all the stories that you want to tell and to connect people. And, you know, I'll give you an example. Um, You know, some of the engagement that we have on social media, especially since the pandemic started, has been kind of record breaking. Um, And a lot of the stuff that we've been sharing, you know, isn't isn't so fun. And, you know, it it just kind of goes with um, 
what the sentiment nationally is on, you know, about what's happening on social media. Government is not an exception to what's happening in the rest of the world. I don't know why there's a mindset that, you know, people think, well, it's government and it's this way. It's no, I mean, we we did the Bernie on a bench uh, last week, a <laughs> social media post outside of one of our um, cool little downtown um, ice cream burrito shops. And it was one of our most popular social media posts that we've had in a very long time. And, you know, people are, are writing, even though we've been doing this for, you know, almost nine years, people are like, check the tagging their friends, like, check this out. What a cool government. Like, did you check out Gilbert? See, you were really hip and cool. And I, I've always tried to explain that. Um, I remember giving a staff training around Periscope when it first came out about using it in emergency situations. And then like a few weeks later, it was Facebook Live and Periscope was kind of, you know, a more global audience, not so localized. And I said, okay, now we need to learn Facebook Live. And everyone's like, but you just told us it was Periscope. <laughs> that was last week. This is this right. week, right? Yeah, and that's exactly. what government doesn't do well is just evolve with the way the world is. You know, I tell, I tell people all the time and I still have to remind people um, in staff meetings, you know, well, that's not what's happening in the world right now, you know, and so our residents are not living in our government box, they're living their lives in the real world. And so how do we, you know, all of these services we provide all of the engagement, how do we connect with them in that way that's going to be meaningful to them. And that changes, you know, it's changed so much in the 10 months since this pandemic started. And so we have to be able to change with that. You know, I want to go back to something that you'd pointed out earlier, Dana, in terms of talking about your community sort of growing up. And you have a very similar story to, to myself. I grew up in Tehachapi, left for just over a decade, and then came back because of the maturity of the community, the new maturity. Because when I was growing up here 20 years ago, there weren't a lot of job prospects in this community. You either were going to go into construction, you're going to work at the wind farms, you're going to work at the prison, or you're going to work at the cement plant. That was basically it. Those were your opportunities. And if you had another career aspiration, you had to leave in order to follow that. And then as the community matured, I mean, even our, our downtown, and I do this in economic development presentations all the time, I tell the funny story of, you know, downtown for me was, it, it was nothing. It was empty buildings, a train depot museum that was a glorified storage lot, and one gas station used to sell me beer when I wasn't 21. I mean, that was basically the, uh, the extent of downtown. Uh -huh. And that's totally <laughs> changed now. And that brought back what this group I like to call the returners. You know, myself and plenty of other people I went to high school with that have brought their businesses back to the community. They, mm -hmm. they lived in big cities, Seattle, San Diego. And they said, nah, it's not for me. When they got older, family time, they wanted to come back to, to, to Hatchby because of the maturity of the community. So that's one of the things that we try to really get off to people. And it sounds like you guys are doing a great job too of like we're not growing per se we're maturing and growing up and evolving because just as our residents grow up uh, you know that what we offer as a city whether it be communication or business is it's got to evolve and grow up as well you're right and it's so funny that you mentioned that because there we had the same thing a liquor store in our downtown that would sell to anyone and now someone that i went to high school with owns it and now they check ID. Yeah, there you uh, go. But, you know, <laughs> and and that you're so you're exactly right. And and that is also an opportunity to tap into the pride that you mentioned, right? What's better than being? I always talk about this with you know whether it's marketing, no matter what you're doing, that passion behind why what you're selling, right? It comes through because someone like me is from here or people that fall in love with Gilbert, you know, what is not to love and you want to share it with everyone. And so again, having that, you know, having the passion behind it. And I think people feel that about Gilbert. They feel it, you know, when we engage with them, they feel it when you meet someone who's from here or you meet, you know, any of our town leadership. So it's very obvious that, you know, people are very, you know, proud to be from here. And so taking full advantage of that is really important, especially when you're doing your marketing, um, you know, showcasing those stories, whether it's, you know, we do a lot of economic development series, um, you know, talking about highlighting all of our businesses, both small and large. And those stories are, you know, so meaningful and important. And we do an, a digital state of the town annually instead of a, you know, a mayoral address with someone behind a podium. And we started that nine years ago and we average, you know, about 250,000 views usually on 
something like that, which is a great marketing and economic development tool, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's a video and, you know, people much more, a larger reach than you can get by having an in-person event, obviously. So um, again, thinking those ways, you know, something that's also more cost-effective than paying for a large event. So those are the opportunities you kind of look for to be able to showcase and, and, and build that pride and bring people into the fold. And like I said, the storytelling is really at the center of all of it. It's so exciting for me to see government transforming itself into more like the the private business. Of course, there are rules and regulations. Of course, we're government. Of course, we're bureaucrats. We, you know, there are, there are things that we do for public safety and all those different elements of who we are. But to see governments like Tehachapi and Gilbert acting more like the citizens, right? We're working for the citizens. You know, when I hired Key part-time four or five years ago, I had this vision of we need to communicate better and then it seems like this last year with, and we've done an amazing job, quite frankly, but this last year with COVID, it has really pushed us into the super fast, like high speed rail <laughs> almost, right? We are forced to be even more so, right? Because this podcast will go out, but then when somebody listens to it, they're going to want the next one or they're going to go to the next platform. And what is that next platform? So we always have to be thinking about kind of that city of the future. Who are we? What are we reinventing? How are we pushing out information to the citizens in the way that they want to receive it? Because there are still people that read newspapers, right? There are. And, but there's mm -hmm. that guy that's always looking for that absolute next step because it's just bam, 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 quick, right? And so as we, as we mature, I look forward to working with citizens in Tehachapi and places like Gilbert and all others, right? so that we can share information and continue to do the right thing, right, in an efficient manner. Say one of our goals when we, we started our digital platforms was to become younger, to reach a younger demographic. And because we are some 50 miles outside of where TV and radio are based, so we were lucky to get a 30-second news story on something that really was hot. So we had to become our, no, our own news agency, if you will, and do constant updates on what's going on. So I think for us, and what I had stressed to Greg, it's about the urgency to get the information out as soon as it's available. As soon as you have it vetted, it's ready to go to get it out. So you're the first to say it rather than chasing rumor control and the, uh, the vicious monster of the keyboard warriors that are out there creating a story. And then it looks like you're, you're chasing it. You're like, Oh, we didn't talk about it yet. And, and it, it sheds a dark light on government for not being aggressive in communicating with the public. So I, I kind of sense that it's really aided to our transparency. And I think that if I, if I look, when I see what you're doing, that's something that you guys feel as well. Absolutely. In fact, when we started this effort nine years ago, we heard a lot of people saying, isn't that propaganda? At that point, we still had a lot of people covering us uh, locally. We had actually three or four dedicated reporters just to Gilbert at that time. And I said, you know, and, and, and they were telling a portion of the story. You know, you talk about the, the pieces of the pie, right? And then there was a, a big portion of it that wasn't being told. And so that's exactly what we were doing, was telling the, our own story. We created a digital newsroom where we were uploading content, video content that our reporters could download and use. And slowly, again, that's how the world, that's how the industry was changing, right? And instead of it being a competition, those reporters became, you know, fewer and far between and they had less content and they were hungry for anything that we could give them and were happy to work with us on that. And I've always tried to explain to the organization, they have a job to do. We have a job to do. How do we work together to make this, you know, beneficial to everyone? And that has changed over time. Like we've, we've had points in time in the last five years, we've had no one covering Gilbert. And so you're right. What is it that residents want to know? They want to know it, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, when sports were more popular, who is the high school football team that's playing in the state championship? Where are they supposed to find that information if, if no one's covering it anymore? And so it is really important that you create, like I said, this um, news space. And it goes back to the trust and the transparency you just mentioned is, you know, if, if you can do it well with quality and you're consistent and um, you build those relationships and people can see government in a different way, then you really are the place that people come to be informed. And, you know, we're not just using our, our Twitter account to talk at 
the local news stations covering us anymore when there's an accident. We're really pushing out information and having a two-way conversation too. You know, that customer service tool that you use with people um, through social media is so critical and, you know, kind of being there 24 seven to answer their questions. And so it's, like I said, it's, it's very similar to what is happening. Like you mentioned in the, in the private sector and, you know, kind of continuing to continuing to evolve that way. Now with us today is Dana Birchman, the chief digital officer for Gilbert, Arizona. So Dana, it's, it's super exciting to have you here. And I just want to make sure everyone knows who it is we're talking to, because usually we're talking to someone here in Tehachapi and they might even recognize the voice. So getting a chance to bring you into this, our conversation is, is pretty exciting. And I want to ask you about the pandemic, because over the past year, I know we've had to try and shift and evolve here in Tehachapi. What's it been like for you? And have you guys changed your philosophies? We made some adjustments in how we kind of support our local business during this pandemic to try and get them as much business and word out, uh, utilizing our social media platforms. What's what, Have you guys done anything to, to help your businesses that was different um, over the past year? Um, I think one of the things that we did recently in the last year, actually prior to the pandemic, which fortunate for me turned out to be a huge benefit during the last year, not just with the pandemic, but with a lot of the social unrest that we saw in June was a centralized communications team. So I now have a marketing person who's in economic development that reports back to me and also uh, the police and fire PIOs report um, into me and they are true marketers, right? They're not, there's not a police officer. Um, and, you, and you'll see a lot of cities that will have the civilian PIOs, but oftentimes they'll still report into the police chief, but they, they actually now all um, report to me, including our um, economic development marketer. And so this has been critical for us through the pandemic, as far as communicating, whether it was um, our CARES Act funding or our local businesses, but coordinating um, with those teams to be sure we get the information out to nonprofits and our local businesses who are going to benefit from some of the funding that's coming through and, you know, doing it in a way again, that's, you know, in the way they want to receive it. And so where, you know, talk about and not just, you know, putting an ad in the newspaper, but really, you know, we, we've been doing a, actually an economic development video series highlighting a lot of our local businesses uh, throughout the pandemic. But, you know, we have seen our social engagement numbers rise, I mean, off the charts. I, uh, between the months of April and July, on an average, we would get about 93 comments a day across our, cha our channels. But during those months, we were averaging more than 600 comments a day. So fielding a lot of questions, and that's where the coordination really comes in. So when you do have someone, whether it's a local business or whoever it is that's reaching out and needs um, you know, resources that we're all coordinated on, what is that response? What is that information we're giving? Also, um, when when it comes to uh, COVID-19 specifically, uh, I have all of the data team underneath me. So all of our um, open data efforts uh, are within my department and, and we have created a dashboard where we're pulling all of um, the more Gilbert specific COVID data, but then also a lot of the statewide resources that are out there. And that's been really helpful even for our school districts and a lot of our businesses um, who are looking for metrics and trying to understand, you know, when and where to keep things open or make closures and have these decisions. So they've said that this has been a really important tool for them. So again, kind of comes back to that coordination of having, you know, having everything set up right which for me was was very fortunate going into this and then having the right people, you know, people that are that understand, again, like we said, how to communicate in a way that our businesses and residents want to be communicated with. If there was one thing that you could, you know, recommend to the city of Tehachapi, right? We're we're one percent of your population. <laughs> but what would you what would you say that would be a something that we should maybe focus on or, or, or look at or not knowing too much about Tehachapi, if anything at all, quite frankly, but what's something that you've learned that we should, we should consider incorporating into our processes? Great question. Well, I always am a big believer in, in starting small in many ways to get you know, a, a win or buy-in, like I said, when I talk about having people that understand on board. One example I often give is, you know, a lot of people think you have to build, I'm sure you guys can relate to this, a big, you know, a big fancy studio. And it's like, why don't you just, or get a camera and all, you know, it's equipment. It's like, start with what's in your hand, right? Like, again, thinking about what is, what is it on your phone? What are those, what are those apps? What are the devices? What are the things that you're using every day? And how can you take that and implement a way to make your residents' lives easier, right? So whether that is how they pay their bills, how they're you know, signing up for a parks and recreation class, um, whatever that might be, 
um, it's really important. And I think right now in a pandemic, when it's more important, I know for us, whether it's vaccination information or, you know, just the case, I mean, Arizona, unfortunately, has been the number one hotspot for COVID cases. And so it's been critical for us to be able to get that information out you know, using new tools. So think about new new places that you haven't ever communicated before. Nextdoor is an incredibly useful tool for us. We have more than two thirds of our residents on there. You know, they're verified residents. I can go right into their inbox and get them information that I need them to quickly. And I can also choose just portions of the community that I want to send information to. Another piece of advice would be thinking about how you work together. Again, not <laughs> none of us could have probably foreseen what this year would have brought, but I was fortunate enough, like I said, to have made some adjustments to our org structure prior to this last year. And, and one of the critical pieces of that was a police PIO. Like I mentioned, uh, she had come from the police uh, department uh, working as a PIO there at Arizona State University and came over and really helped us through a critical time in our community when we had uh, protests that were happening weekly and, um, you know, uh, Police departments all across the country were under, you know, new types of scrutiny. And, and so that relationship, building community meetings and listening sessions between the police chief and your residents and, you know, and connecting that to your mayor and, and everything that's going on, whether it's um, how we talk about diversity or inclusion or all those efforts. Um, and so thinking about the most, again, back to what's happening in the world, right? What are those most critical topics? And then how do you bring people together in the right way that makes sense to address them? And then, I mean, obviously, again, is like I said, you know, having the right people with the right skill sets. I think that's a huge, you know, I, I still talk um, over and over at, and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues that have heard me every year, we're in the middle of our budget process right now. And I'm always saying, if you never got another dollar or another person, how do you continue to innovate? How do you take what you have and figure out how to transform, right? And instead of that pile on mentality of I'm going to ask for this, these people to do X, Y, or Z, it's what can I do with what I have and what don't I need anymore? Or what can I stop doing so that I can free up time to do these other things? And I think whether there's a pandemic or not, those are critical questions that we have to be asking ourselves, especially in government um, on an ongoing basis, if you do want to continue to innovate. When I listen to you, I am looking at out what we're doing and going, okay, we're, we're working in those directions. We've gotten a lot of support from our community on our different platforms, and we utilize Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I've noticed that having a strong relationship with other surrounding agencies, particularly for us, our, our, our Caltrans, our California Transit, trying to develop good networking and, and those partnerships so that way when they're putting out information that relates to us, that we're able to share it as quickly as possible they to think our about audience. You. You right. Know, they think about, oh, I make sure, I'm going to make sure Key gets this, you right. know, so he can help, you know, he can share it and attach be that kind of stuff. Yeah. We created a PIO network in our region of the county to get all the PIOs from all the different agencies together, both through public safety and just the other agencies, just so we're talking yeah. on a regular basis. And then we had a, we had a big earthquake over a year ago in Ridgecrest, which is about 50, 60 miles away, which kind of, prompted this a little bit. And then with all the wildfires and flooding and things that we've experienced, and then even with the pandemic, as PIOs, we've got together and communicated. And so I'm, I brought you in here to become a part of our PIO network from a distance, if you will. <laughs> so, uh, but it's been about these conversations, I think that we've benefited. I know I personally have benefited in what I do here, uh, engaging with the community. So do you guys have, what are your working relationships or do you work on those with your surrounding agencies? You guys are much bigger than us. And I know you've got like Facebook pages for each of your different departments. We have one Facebook page that includes everything, but you know, that's, that's a lot of information to gather. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that's a great, those are great points. I, you know, yes, we definitely partner with agencies around us. Um, you know, to be honest, I think we have a different approach than probably most of our surrounding cities when it comes to communicating. Uh, we do now have, you know, multiple Facebook pages, but we didn't when we started. So that's another point to make when I said start small is, you know, I've noticed other cities, they have like a Facebook page for every 
city pool. You don't want you don't want that. You don't want to be segmenting your audience too much. You want to be sure that it's um, streamlined and thoughtful, and you don't want to miss people, right? Like leave people out. So even though it looks like now we do have more, you know, we have our police and fire and our parks and recreation and our main Gilbert Town Hall pages. Um, we're they're all run in my department, and it's all very coordinated. Especially when there's emergency information to go out, you will see it across every channel, right? That's why it is very important to not let everyone or a department go rogue and have their own channels or they're over here doing their own thing. And so making sure that that's all centralized and set up well. And then you mentioned, you know, how you reach out to other groups. Like we work with a lot of, you know, our Arizona Department of Transportation. They're awesome on social media. Um, I've had them on before um, with our podcast and they do some really cool things and, and using um, groups like our Department of Health, obviously the information they're putting out right now around the vaccine. I mean, those that's critical. And especially when you're sharing third party information, a lot of times for your residents, it's, you know, even for them, it's another step closer to the source. And so they're like, okay, and, and they might feel more comfortable um, with that. But then also I wanted to just point out to remember, you mentioned a um, Again, uh, your snow, the snow yesterday, we had a bunch of, we had pockets of snow in Phoenix too, which was really cool. But, um, you know, using 311, right? Like our residents tell us because they're so engaged on 311 and using that tool and app that before, like we would ever know from another agency or from anyone else, I will guarantee you that someone will send us a picture and we will already know about it on 311 and they will say, hey, this is closed, this is happening, this is here, there. Um, we do all kinds of things to incentivize our residents to wanna to use the app. So we do like a holiday lights map where you can go on, decorate your house and then go into 311 and tag yourself there, right? And then you're using, so we connect it to our open data portal and we connect it on our social media channels and we have people you know, competing, we give out prizes to the best holiday lights. So connecting all these pieces together. So Alex is our open data portal that we use. And so we want to drive traffic there for people to actually use our open data portal. And so one of the ways to do that is doing engaging things you know, with you know, getting them to, you know, holiday lights is a perfect example of kind of tricking them into participating. And so we do that a lot because otherwise, you know, when it happens to you, right, your trash doesn't get taken out or your tree falls down, you know, you're, you're likely to look for 311 and submit a request like that. But when you truly engage your community and your community feels connected as a whole, what you find is they start to tell you all kinds of things that you didn't know, you know, not just about the pothole in the road, but maybe issues that are happening at a local park. And, and it doesn't even have to be about them anymore. They understand that the bigger connection to the community and, and how certain issues can impact them. And so you kind of have to draw them in, you know, and obviously in a more engaging way. And, and like I said, if, if you have them already there, when you need them, when you have a major incident, you talked about an earthquake or when we've had a flood, they're already there. And I think the census was a great example of this in the last year. I had many communities reach out to me and say, oh no, now the census is online. What are we going to do? We haven't really put any effort into our online engagement. How are we going to get people to complete the census? And I said, hey, I've been planning for this for nine years for the online census. Like this didn't just happen overnight, right? We we built online engagement so that we would be successful in a census like this. We build online engagement so that people will turn out to vote. And they will understand that, you know, that is their ultimate way of showing their civic engagement is when we need them to pass a streets bond, they will understand why and they will show up. And we had our largest voter turnout we've ever had in both our primary and um, the general election this year. And that was in the middle of a pandemic, right? Because we make it easy to engage with people. We give them the information. We make it easy for them to participate, whether it's the census or voting or, um, like I said, reporting an issue. Um, again, it, it's all connected. So, Dana, what you just said is music to my ears because getting – it's so exciting to me in Tehachapi, and I, I hear it from you and Gilbert – that the citizens are are being becoming integrated into their government, right? It used to be government was creating silos, building silos, right? And let's be honest, the taxpayer doesn't care. They don't care, right? They pay their taxes. They don't care if you're sheriff or fire or police or planning or public works or whatever. They just want it done. But now mm -hmm. with social media and all of these new tools, the public has an opportunity to engage and to tell us we have learned so much from the citizens. It's not just that old, you know, in and out, in and out paper agendas, or this is what we've got going on. 
its integration and its participation and its, you know, tell us what you're thinking, good, bad, or indifferent. Let us know so that we can we can first tell you what the facts are so that we can start moving forward and we can all be on the same page, right? You might not like the answer, but certainly you need to know what's up first. And then we can work together to either solve the problem or make something good great, right? And so it's Mm -hmm. all part of that integration. It's really exciting for me to talk to you about this because it's something I have been, we at the city, you know, I've surrounded myself with people. Everyone at the city is, is way smarter than me, way smarter than me. And we're mm-hmm. moving forward, getting things done. And I'm super excited about being a almost a sister city with Gilbert. I love it. I think it's a great plan. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you have anything that you can tease us with that you're, you guys are looking at that uh, isn't top secret, but, you know, you know, What's, what's on the there horizon? There are no you... secrets in government. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Ooh, okay, we're all Love it. I do. So I mentioned that we had rolled out a new um, logo and brand. Uh, we It was adopted by our council December 15th. And so we are actually um, rolling that out to the organization February 1st. And then uh, we'll be doing the website. So the website you're looking at, I know you think it's really cool now. We'll just wait until you see this new brand. But the whole idea around that, it builds upon the mission, which you mentioned, which is anticipate, create, and help people. And it's about shaping our future together. And so we're going to be using that as a, um, a marketing campaign. We always said this is a community brand. This is a brand for the next 100 years. This was Gilbert's 2020 was actually Gilbert's centennial year. And so we had a lot of plans that couldn't you know, come to fruition because of the pandemic, as you mentioned. Um, but the one thing we did get across the finish line was updating our logo and brand and adopting a new color scheme and um, everything that goes along with that. So we are really excited about this because we've actually had pockets of our organization that had kind of had their own brand going and never really had a formalized guidebook and standards around, you know, not just what the look and feel is, but how we talk about ourselves. You know, again, we're the largest town in America. And so kind of moving away from that and and what are other ways that we tell the story of Gilbert. And so I'm really excited because I think the community is going to get really excited about it. And um, I know our organization, our employees are as well. And so there are endless opportunities um, for how we can use and implement that in the coming future. Like I said, some of the dreams and plans we had because of the current state of affairs aren't uh, coming to life, but it will be digitally uh, launched shortly. And so if you come back to that website that I know you were looking at, uh, you're going to see an even a really cool uh, update in the coming month. www.gilbertaz.gov. And what other platforms, If I know there's, we piqued some interest about Gilbert, Arizona here. Where can people follow you on what are the, some of the platforms on social media? Yeah, oh my gosh, thank you for asking. So I'm a big believer in kind of following those trends like you talked about. And we're definitely seeing a ton of success with um, Instagram Reels and other places that, you know, we didn't necessarily see before. And so I would highly encourage, and it's funny because I still have to tell my, our employees sometimes, you know, to engage with us on social media because we're literally posting content every day. Um, Different content maybe on Twitter than we do on Facebook and Instagram. But if you want to follow our channels, they are all listed at the website you mentioned, gilbertaz.gov. Uh, slash connect. And so if you go to that website, you will see um, we manage more than 30 social media channels across the organization. Like I said, they're all um, centralized within our department, but you can follow the mayor, you can follow our town manager um, is also very active on LinkedIn and other places. So um, we work with our HR department a lot on how they're promoting new jobs. We talked about the city of the future. Um, Jobs of the future is another uh, huge focus for us. And so how we talk about being a a desired place of employment and a place that you will want to work. And so we put a lot of effort and focus into that as well. And so um, whether it's LinkedIn or um, maybe the more fun stuff on Instagram, I hope you'll follow us and, and check it out. Dana Birchman, Chief Digital Officer from Gilbert, Arizona. We can't thank you enough. Really appreciate it. I, I learned quite a bit from this conversation, so I appreciate your time. And I kept you longer than I always seem to do that. I always <laughs> tease my guests with 15 to 20 minutes, and I, I take you 30 minutes plus. <laughs> That's okay. It's been a pleasure. I'm so happy to connect with you and look forward to a continued relationship. Thank you. Thank appreciate you very much. Thank you. Well, that was Dana Birchman from Gilbert, Arizona. I don't know, guys. I, for me, it was it was my niche, my little communications world. But I think it translated, you know, that we're, we're on the right path of everything that we're doing. They've been doing it a little bit longer than we have. 
and they're obviously much larger and they got more people doing it. But I think we're doing a pretty good job of getting information out to our community. It's always good to do check and balances and confirmation that, yeah. that we're, we're on the right track. Of course, we've got a lot. And, and we ask listeners, right, let us know. We're always begging, you know, call <laughs> us or email us. But we want to know. But it's really nice to know that a bigger city is, is doing the same thing that we're doing, essentially. And her energy and, and education and background, it's, it's valuable to the residents, right? It's not just, hey, let's just put a Facebook page and, you know, t- you know, talk about blah, blah, blah. It's information. It's yeah. data that you will need to know. And I think you need to, and, and I brought up a little bit before, but you have to be able to kind of pick and choose what you're able to do and what works for you. You know, in my, in, in my college athletics communications days, uh, you know, I'd go to these conferences, right? And you'd have, you know, and everybody would go to these sessions and the University of Oregon would be presenting and they'll be talking about, yeah, we created a social media cave and we had a $500,000 budget and we created this studio to allow our, you know, student athletes to sit there and do social media and do live interviews and record videos. And like all these people are like, yeah, yeah. And, and, but meanwhile, someone like me is going, okay, there's no shot that I would ever have that budget. Let, you know, so you had to cut, okay, what could I take from that? You know, and, and even that with, with, what Dana has, there's a lot of great things with that, that Gilbert is doing that necessarily don't either fit to Atchaby or funding isn't there, mm-hmm. but if you start small and find a few things and find ways to get to people, you could, you can build to that level. It might take a while, but there are certain things that's, that work within budget and, uh, you know, per, uh, personnel and even just community constraints that, that, uh, you know, there's someone's best practices that still apply. That's right. You know, and that was something that she said, start small. Yeah. You know, let's, let's be good at what we're, we're doing in a small basis and then you can grow. And then she said overnight for them, boom, they took off. And I know like each time we have an event like this weather event, when I look at what goes on with our engagement, people are looking for that information. Yeah. So we see a, a huge engagement, especially around weather related mm-hmm. type events here in Tehachapi makes total sense you know winter we get snow and roads get closed the freeway gets closed and people can't get to work so they look at us and i start seeing that engagement grow and um, you know developing our relationships and with that said in one of our next couple of episodes we're going to be talking to christine nadler from caltrans Mm. another pio that we communicate with and work with and and share that information and christine's going to come on to hatch upon just to talk about how Caltrans talks to the community. So for those that are listening, you're going to find out a little bit more about how to get information as fast as possible from Caltrans on one of the uh, upcoming mm-hmm. episodes. I here look to forward to it. Yeah. Perfect. And if you have any questions, thoughts, or ideas, and particularly the questions, if you've got a question for us that we can answer here on the show, and that's something Corey brought up on the last yeah. show, we would love to hear it. Send it yeah. to us via email, media at TehachapiCityHall.com. So obviously not something that uh, you have to have answered right now. But if it's something in general, whether it's a philosophy or something that we're doing or something maybe you'd like to see us doing, send it to us. And we can have that conversation and uh, see if we can answer those questions for you simply by shooting us an email, media at TehachapiCityHall.com. Anything else we have to look forward to that you guys can think of uh, that's coming up? We've got, I mean, obviously we're... Winter came very yeah. quickly. L- looking forward to thawing out mm-hmm. uh, yeah. here. And <laughs> spring around the corner. So, yeah. and uh, we, we also, if you're curious about the vaccinations for COVID-19, go to Kern County Public Health's website. They've yeah. got all the information there. They have the information regarding Adventists, how yeah, you, you can yeah. sign up for that. You can even check out our website too. Our COVID-19 resource page has been updated right on the front of that with the, not only the process for the Adventist Health Tatchby Valley vaccinations, but we have added the piece from the Kern County Department of Public Health, their Excellent. Kern County Fairground site, which uh, there's a phone number you have to call. And again, very similar to what Adventist Health is dealing with, personnel getting those calls returned and then what their vaccine supply is going to look like. They don't know yet. They're kind of underneath the state and the allocation. So again, you call the number if you qualify, great, but you have to be patient because you know, they don't know what they have yet to be able to give out. But that information there is, is well on our COVID-19 resource page on our on our liveuptatchby.com and right there on the top, COVID-19 alert. Well, there you go. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the conversation about communications today and how we're developing our plan and moving forward here in Tehachapi and how Gilbert, Arizona is doing it as one of the leaders in communication for uh, towns and cities across the United States. This is Tehachapod. And we will uh, catch up with you again real soon. Thanks for joining us. 
To Hatch a Pod is a conversation about Tehachapi designed for the people who live here or who would like to know more about this mountaintop community. If you have a question you would like answered, email media at tehachapicityhall.com. We will try to answer it on a future episode of Tehachapod.